Folks, hello and welcome to another fantastic show. Uh, we are very excited to have this going today. Um, we've got a really a fantastic guest. First time she's been here and hopefully not the last. But um, I want to introduce myself first off. I'm Eric Wells. I'm the support group director for Recovering from Religion. And with me today is Kara Griffin, and she is the co uh, she's a helpline agent over on uh, with RFR. And um, I already asked this, but how are you doing today, Kara? I am still doing well. Thank you for asking again. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Went on a hike this weekend, I'm starting to explore my home state now, and I'm really, really uh, enjoying this, the, the whole state. This is just a fan. Colorado is amazing. Um, well, folks, just like every RFRX, we at the beginning, we have a poll. And this poll, the questions here are designed to kind of get you in the mindset of what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. And remember that these poll, this poll is anonymous, so we're not going to be able to see how you answer the questions. The very first question we have here is, have you ever felt judged by your non-belief? Yes, no, I'm not sure, or I'm still a believer. Question number two, do you feel like people sometimes make assumptions about your morals Ethic, morals or ethics when they find out you're a non-believer? Yes, no, I'm not sure, or I'm still a believer. Question number three, do you feel like you're treated differently because of your non-belief? And again, same four answers. Yes, no, I'm not sure, or I am still a believer. And the final question, are you open about your non-belief? Uh, yes, no, or I'm still a believer. So we're going to let that poll run for the, uh, the beginning here until we get the introductions going uh, for our guest. But uh, without further ado, um, Kara, why don't you tell us what RFRx is? What are we doing here today? Yeah, what are we doing here? Yes, so RFRx, it's our super fun Monday night session uh, that we do every week uh, where we bring in a guest to discuss a topic that might be relevant to folks in RFR. So today we're going to be talking, for example, about the stigma of non-belief or coming out as a non-believer, but we talk about all kinds of other issues too. We talk about, uh, we sometimes we have series that go on that are about specific religions or religious beliefs where somebody comes in and talks about their experience in that, helpful tips and strategies for dealing with religious issues or religious family members, relationships relationships, gender and sexuality, whatever the case may be. We have tons of interesting speakers come and talk to us all the time. Uh, so it's just kind of a new thing every week. And these are things that are intended to provide some good advice or coping skills for people about things that might be relevant to them, but it's not a replacement for our online community or our support groups, which we also still have. It's more like a complement to those communities that we started doing uh, during the pandemic and we are continuing to do. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions or comments or inquiries about it or ideas for future topics, you can send those to us via email at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. And also all of our previous recordings of these sessions can be found on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash recoveringfromreligion. And uh, Eric, do you want to tell us a little bit more about RFR? Heck yeah, I do. <laughs> Folks, so um, RFRX is part of a bigger organization, a much bigger organization called Recovering from Religion. And our mission statement is to offer hope, healing, and support to those who are struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. And we have several programs that um, kind of address and work inside of our mission statement. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how Recovering from Religion offers healing. Kara, take it away. Yeah, so the main way that we offer healing is through our helpline, which is available 24-7 via online chat or phone call. You can do either one that you're comfortable with, and you find that through um, our website. Uh, you can call or chat in there to speak with a helpline agent who's available, and they'll listen with an empathetic ear. They're not going to be judgmental or critical. They're not going to proselytize you or anything like that. Um, they're just there to help, and also you can directly visit our resources page on our website as well at recoveringfromreligion.org slash resources. Um, 
And so those are both the two main ways that we do healing. Um, the way we offer hope uh, is our second sort of uh, pillar that we have here. And uh, that's mainly done through sharing and listening to personal stories, um, which is just another way of kind of connecting with people. Sometimes hearing about other people's particular experience can uh, kind of help us see, wow, that person really was able to get through that. That, that gives me hope that, you know, I can, I can get where I want to be as well, or just to be able to, to empathize and, and recognize um, our struggles with other people. Um, so that's, uh, that's how we do hope. And that's something that we share on our blog, which is at medium.com slash excommunications. And you can also visit our podcast at recoveringfromreligion.org slash podcast. And then Eric, would you like to talk about support? I thought you'd never ask. I love the support program. Um, I'm the director of the support groups. And so I'm not biased or anything, but it's uh, it happens to be the best program that we've got in recovery. <laughs> but um, the support groups, this is where we meet face to face, whether it's um, in person or it's virtual via Zoom. This is an opportunity where we can identify and start to work on the long-term issues uh, from where religion has hurt us in the past. Or this is even a safe place for us to discuss and express some doubts that we're having, even if we're um, not out of our religion, which is perfectly fine. Um, these groups are not at all designed to uh, be a deconversion at all. We don't interested in deconverting folks who uh, come to these support groups. It's simply a place where we can foster the healing um, uh, that came from uh, that or the foster the healing from the trauma that we've experienced. Right now we have over 60 support groups around the world and we're growing all the time. Anytime that we've got a new volunteer in a in a big metro area, we are more than happy to open up a, a support group in that area. You can find the nearest one to you at um, our website, and I'm going to go ahead and drop a link into the chat. Now, we talked about the helpline, and we talked about the support groups, and both of those are peer support. There's not really any professional training that's done for folks to, for volunteers to run and help out on the helpline or in the support groups. There is training, but it's not professional training, so we don't give advice and we don't diagnose. But more often than not, we may need more than what peer support can offer. And so what we have done is we've created a directory where folks can sign up, create an account, and be connected to secular therapists nearby. And this is called the Secular Therapy Project, as uh, it might make sense to call it. <laughs> but this is where we can connect with licensed mental health uh, care pro pro professionals. And these professionals are carefully screened to ensure that they have the appropriate licensing in their state or in their country to make sure that they maintain a secular practice. So you won't run the risk of getting proselytized to, like going home and concentrating on a Bible verse or going home and praying on your, your issue that you came uh, to talk to them about. Uh, in addition, they're vetted to make sure that they use uh, exclusively use evidence-based treatments. And so you can find all of those folks, you can sign up and create an account at and find a secular therapist near you at seculartherapy.org. Next, we have the online community, the Recovering from Religion online community. And this is a place where you might be able to find like-minded folks. Uh, there was this need where, hey, we love the support groups, we love the helpline, but we also could use a um, place where we can talk with like-minded folks about some of the things that we're struggling with. And so we created the online community. This is not a publicly accessible community, so you have to be, you have to go through the helpline and uh, sort of do a bit of an interview before you're invited to the Slack uh, online community. But um, they have got Sunday night Zoom meetings where they kind of hang out. They've got um, uh, all sorts of different channels in which you can join, like if you're struggling, if you're in the military and you're, you're, or an ex-former military, if you're a former Jehovah's Witness or a former Muslim, then we have all these separate channels with folks in it who have been through something similar. So if you are interested in joining the um, RFR online community, go to our helpline, either call or chat with an agent, and um, they'll be able to get you set up. And in addition to that, another community that you might be interested in, and they are currently streaming this very show to their Discord channel, the Atheist Community of Discord. A ton of great like-minded folks 
um, who uh, might be interested in listening to you. <laughs> but um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, drop a chat, a link into to, um, their Discord channel in there as well. Okay, I've been talking for a while, Kara. You want to take the next thing? Absolutely. I, we can talk next about my favorite thing, volunteering. Um, that's actually another way um, that we offer healing here. Um, it can come from helping others, which is one way that a lot of our volunteers find meaning and purpose. Volunteering for RFR has definitely been tremendously meaningful for me personally, especially being able to connect with the secular community during COVID and things like that. Um, there's, there's really a lot uh, that can come from that. And in fact, we are always in need of more volunteers. So if that sounds like something that you would like to get involved in, please, please, please let us know. You can go to recoveringfromreligion.org slash volunteer to learn all about what that would entail. And of course, there are plenty of ways that you can volunteer here. We talked about all the different kinds of things that we do, like the helpline and the online community and the support groups and moderators and things like that. We always need those positions filled. And we do provide training if you think you might be a good fit for a helpline agent or something like that. But also, we always have a need for all kinds of other skills, too. If you're a project manager or you have really good tech skills, you know how to operate the Zoom. Uh, we need people who can do the things. Troll smashers, we have some excellent troll smashers i dare say some of the best in the industry but <laughs> so if that any of that sounds interesting to you or you have other skills that you think we might be able to benefit from we're all 100 percent volunteers here and nobody's getting paid to do this so come and join the fun and we'll be glad to have you and that is that is about it for me eric do you want to talk about today you bet. Folks, here in the U.S., uh, I know that uh, there's many folks who are not, uh, in the U.S. that are joining us tonight, but here in the U.S., it's Memorial Day. And this is a day where we take some time to remember the folks who have fought and died for our country um, throughout all of the wars that we've had. But this doesn't have to be a purely United States thing. So let's all just kind of take a moment of silence and um, in, in memory of the folks who fought and uh, died for the various countries that um, we all represent. So just give a couple of moments of silence. Excellent. Well, thank you, folks. All right, um, Kara, tell us what is gonna happen this evening? What can folks expect to see? Yes, a little brief outline. Absolutely. So our format here usually is that we, after we do our long-winded introduction uh, that we tend to do, uh, we then go into our actual discussion with our guest uh, for about an hour, um, and she'll discuss with us about her topic. And during that time, if you have any questions that you want to ask her about, please put those into the chat, or you can just message them to, to Eric or myself. That would work too. Uh, but type them in. We'll be collecting those. And then at the end of the hour, we'll have a question and answer session for maybe about 20 minutes where we'll go through those questions and have a little bit more back and forth. Uh, after that's over, we'll have some closing, closing thoughts from Dr. Daryl Ray, um, who will speak with us about um, news and updates. And then we then switch gears and turn off the recording and have our hangout session, which is one of the more popular features of our RFRX sessions that can go on and on pretty late into the night sometimes where we just hang out and talk and discuss and chat with each other um, about whatever topics have you know popped up into your head during the discussion tonight or whatever else and our guest may be able to stick around with us for part of that time we'll see how late it gets um, to have more discussion and dialogue there as well but that's a time for everybody to just kind of relax and not worry about the recording and just just chat and discuss so we'll go through all of those and here in just a second. And Eric, do you want to uh, lead mm -hmm. us in? You bet. Uh, so today we have Erin Lewis and Dr. Dale Ray has asked specifically if she can introduce her. So Dr. Ray, take it away. Thanks, Eric. And thanks for doing that Memorial Day um, piece. I appreciate that. I live in Kansas City where the National Museum, the National Museum for World War I is. And Memorial Day is pretty special and big thing here in Kansas City uh, because it's, it's it was pretty closely tied to World War I uh, way back when. Of course, it isn't now, but it was. So I am delighted to, to introduce Aaron tonight. 
Uh, I, Aaron's one of those people I feel like I know her. We interact on, on social media more than uh, probably most people would interact who've ne never met each other. Uh, although I think, according to a mutual friend of ours, we, we did meet. I just don't remember it. And she doesn't remember it, if I recall, Aaron. <laughs> I was on book tour in, uh, in California around Sacramento. I stayed at Judy Saint's house, who edited uh, Aaron's most recent book, I, I believe. And um, uh, Judy said uh, that Aaron and I met at the time. So Aaron is uh, uh, one of the more interesting human beings you'll ever meet if you ever get to meet her. And that's why I think we're in for a real treat tonight. I'm going to briefly read what, what she says about herself, but then I'm going to tell you some more stuff. Aaron's a former adult entertainer and a present day author. She has written three nonfiction books about her life as a stripper and several short fiction stories. Erin has a lifelong love of horror and dark humor, but more importantly, she's an advocate of critical thinking, humanism, and healthy sexual expression. So I, I got out of the blue, Judy sent me a manuscript of this book, and I thought, okay, I'm not sure I know this person, I don't remember her, and it took me a while to get around to getting the book. I, get a, I probably get a manuscript a week. You know, People are always sending me shit to read, and I can't possibly read it all. But when I finally sat down and started reading this thing, it's called Expose Yourself. It is hilarious. But more importantly, it's true. And it's really uh, what, what blew my mind was how many lessons uh, you can take from being an adult entertainer. And I'm just going to read you a couple chapter titles because I think that'll uh, whet your appetite for what we're getting ready to hear tonight. Uh, these are just random titles, so to speak. Uh, chapter number six, God told me to touch your pussy. Um, that's a title you probably never heard before. <laughs> number eight, let your genitals be your guide. Uh, chapter 10, find your own heaven. Uh, ch uh, chapter uh, 11, uh, letting go of hell. And uh, chapter 18, call me a stripper. Uh, 19, more than a pair of boobs. Now, that's, uh, that's an interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh chapter 22 some strippers need jesus okay i that that's interesting <laughs> but last and this is the most i think the best one of all when you take risks you find yourself i think that is a nice piece of wisdom right there so aaron thank you so much i've been looking forward to this i i would not have let eric, eric uh introduce you because i was going to jump in and pull rank if i had to <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Erin. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I am quite excited that you got to introduce me. Um, I, uh, I do not remember us meeting either, but I do feel like, um, like we've connected a little bit and uh, hopefully one day we'll uh, get to shake hands and hug and do all that stuff. Um, so I kind of got into writing um, because of stigmas and stereotypes due to my job. Um, and a lot of the things that I saw on talk shows in the news and things like that had, um, had a lot of really negative things to say about well, what I did, um, which I kind of figured when I started dancing in the first place, I knew that I was entering something that was, you know, kind of on the fringe and that people would disapprove of and, and stuff like that. But the more I danced, the more I realized, uh, how many real misconceptions there were and how many um, judgments there were based on things that weren't, you know, universally true. Uh, certainly stereotypes tend to come from, you know, maybe a, a kernel of truth. There are certainly some stereotypes that apply to dancers that, that have a little bit of truth to it. Um, but I really started writing because I wanted to put a different narrative out there uh, and, and really kind of open people's eyes to see that, you know, we're people and, and we're not all the same thing. Um, so I ended up kind of falling into atheism and this type of advocacy or activism when uh, I got involved with the Freedom From Religion Foundation and went to their first convention where I met the uh, ineffable Judy Saint, who did edit my book, Expose Yourself. And she kind of 
I, I told her that I'd written some other books and I was interested in getting involved and I wanted to volunteer. And uh, part of me was a little weary because of what I did as a dancer. And I'm thinking, well, what does, you know, my dancing have to do with um, atheism or freedom from religion or free thinking or critical thinking or anything like that? And she says, well, it, you know, it has a whole lot to do with it. You've, you know, you've already dealt with these stigmas and, and pushed back on some of the things that people think about you without knowing you or knowing your profession. And um, I argued with her a lot. Um, Judy is something that's a little <laughs> difficult to argue with because <laughs> she always wins. Um, but she really convinced me that I had a lot to offer um, as far as with my experiences. And so as we went through Expose Yourself and, and uh, came up with the different topics and chapters, um, I realized more and more that a lot of what I did really did relate to um, people that are coming out of religion or uh, finally finding the freedom and the confidence to be able to say that they are non-believers or they're non-religious. And um, I had maybe a different way of saying it, although I must say that Daryl's book, uh, Sex and God, really opened my eyes to how many connections there were to religion and um, people's ideas around sex, which is something that I encountered a lot in my job. Um, a lot of people think, you know, it's just about ogling over naked body parts and sexuality but a lot of my job involved really talking to people and getting to know people and of course there was that sexual element but in that sexual element there was um a hint of fundamentalism and religiosity and guilt and shame about what they were feeling and it wasn't, um, you know, it's not as nefarious as people say. Everybody has natural feelings around sex and things like that. Um, and a lot of the shame and guilt that brought people to me in the first place had a lot to do with the way that they were raised. Um, you know, so when you, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. When you, uh, when, when I was kind of first presented with this topic, at first I didn't get it. And then um, you, uh, you filled out your outline. And as I was kind of like reading through it, I'm like, holy crap, there is an incredibly close connection between uh, um, uh, what I experienced as an atheist and kind of how you describe your own experience as a former um, dancer. Um, if you don't mind, can you feel like we can start at the beginning and kind of tell us um, what was your background? Like how uh, how how were you raised in a, in a religious um, family? I am the last of six kids, so um, maybe obviously I came from a Catholic family. Um, but after my mom had my brother, who would be number five, uh, she they took a break from having kids. Um, birth control had obviously been an issue when they first got married. Um, after five kids, you know, they softened that stance a little bit. And, um, <laughs> so about nine years later, I came about, um, and by that time, the Catholicism in my family had really kind of softened a lot to the point where, you know, it was kind of like weddings and funerals. Um, we would go to church, you know, basically the same thing, sit, stand and kneel, try to remember what people are mumbling to each other. Um, I was baptized, but I never made to communion. So I, you know, never had the cracker and the wine, but my siblings did. So I had a little bit of a different experience than the rest of my brothers and sisters. Um, and for the most part, it was really just an empty, emphasis in the belief of a higher power or God. Um, mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of really fundamentalist uh, religious beliefs in my family. You know, we heard the Bible stories. Um, I think there's a joke somewhere that Catholics don't read the Bible. Uh, we definitely didn't. I, I'm not sure that we must have had one somewhere. Um, but, you know, I heard the soft, the kids books with the pictures. And even then it was, for me, it was mostly Beatrix Potter and Dr. Seuss. I didn't get a lot of the same type of Bible stories that, that like my brothers and sisters did. I went to Sunday school like once, um, but I was a real pain in the butt because I always asked a lot of questions. Um, and then I realized that I wasn't supposed to be asking those questions and then I would get in trouble and then they would just be like, let's not take her to Sunday school anymore. And that, you know, that, that was pretty much it um, as far as my religious upbringing. So basically 
my beliefs were, if you are a good person, you go to heaven. You know, my family was, um, my dad owned a business. So, you know, everything was pretty much cool. They liked their alcohol. Um, you know, they liked their sketchy tax returns and things like that. So there wasn't, there wasn't really a lot of like, um, it, religion wasn't really pushed on me. I wasn't really indoctrinated in that sense, uh, that I've come to learn a lot of other people were, um, which really surprised me because I didn't realize that that's how, um, <laughs> I, I didn't realize that that type of, um, people took religion that seriously. It just wasn't how I, I, I was raised. I was just going to ask is you mentioned earlier about kind of learning about the guilt and shame that clients and customers were feeling. Is that one of the ways that you realized um, how indoctrinated um, this information was in, in other people's upbringing? I, you know, I, I, a lot of times that wasn't something that came up a lot. Like, um, you know, people wouldn't say, well, I feel this way because of this. I feel this way about that. But after meeting Judy and Judy actually suggested Daryl's book. And actually it was Daryl's book that really put that connection to me um, because I hadn't really connected the two. And then I was able to remember back and I had a lot of like regular customers that, you know, we would sit and talk and have a lot of conversations with. And that was when I was really able to put it together um, that, wow, this is a lot of other people's experiences, but our conversations weren't a lot of, you know, people didn't say, oh, well, I was raised really religiously. And so I feel bad about it, but going back and talking about the conversations now, I, it, it kind of connected, um, after, mm -hmm. after I learned more about it. Mm. Like maybe it could have been something that they weren't even consciously making that connection themselves either. I think a lot of times, yes. And then, you know, religion is one of those things that's a little prickly, but it's also because of my job, um, people tend to be anonymous. Um, I didn't use a stage name, but people didn't know that I didn't use a stage name. They assumed that it was. And, you know, I don't know that somebody, when they tell me their name or who they are, that they're necessarily telling me the truth. So there's a certain anonymity. I can never say that word. Um, when you have those kinds of conversations, so they they tend to be very open and honest um, and raw because nobody's hiding from anybody. Um, you're just all out there. Um, so uh, there was a lot of it that I just didn't really, um, I didn't, we didn't necessarily speak about religion per se, but coming back to it, you understand why they, why they behave the way or why they framed things in a certain way. It, it made sense once I, once I thought about it. So you kind of had this um, soft, uh, seems like a soft Catholic upbringing, and um, it didn't seem to really sort of be like a big deal to you. Um, and then uh, how did you move from uh, your your soft Catholic upbringing into getting into uh, the, the your former profession as a dancer? Um, well, it didn't, there was really not much of a connection as I, as I grew up, because Catholicism wasn't a big part of my life or any type of religion, really, I really kind of went through a lot of different um, belief systems, or I, I was curious about a lot of things. So I looked into reincarnation. Um, I was a Wiccan for like eight months when I was 15 or something like that. I found a book in the thrift store and I was like, ooh, spells. Uh, none of them worked, by the way. And um, I, I graduated high school early. And I actually started working really early. And then I moved out when I was 17 and um, I really didn't like my job. So I, I had spent a good portion of my childhood kind of being insecure about my looks. And um, when I started to dance, there was a lot of freedom in it. Uh, there was a lot of um, self-confidence I found because now I'm getting all this attention and, you know, people are talking about how pretty I am and I'm like, what me? Are you kidding? Um, and so it was really, uh, it was really eye opening to me, but it, it, religion really didn't play a part in my choosing to dance. Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Um, I, I kind of went through high school feeling similar, like, oh my God, I'm the ugliest guy here. Nobody really kind of likes me. Um, but, uh, so I can pretty much relate to that. And it's so cool that you kind of found a way to, uh, through dancing to 
get us some self esteem. Um, did that seem to keep up the, the for you the whole time you were dancing? Um, sometimes it depends, actually, and it's funny because um, now that I'm out and been retired now for about two two years. Um, Dancing really parallels a lot of other things. It, it definitely parallels writing in that respect, as far as the self-esteem goes, because sometimes you, you know, you feel really good about what you're doing. And then other times you're like questioning everything. And it's like, what am I doing this for every, you know, this is the worst thing ever. And so dancing emotionally had a lot of ups and downs. Um, there are nights when you are just really excited to be there. You're on fire, you know, everybody's clapping and it's great. And then there are nights where you just feel like a, piece of dirt on the bottom of somebody's shoe and it's like mm. really um emotionally it, it's a roller coaster there's a lot of ups and downs um with that and I gotta say probably the earliest parts of my dancing I did still have that um belief in a higher power or something looking out for me or or in that kind of stuff um but when I think about it now, I didn't find a lot of comfort in it because there was never any, there was never any, um, it never really seemed, it, it felt like there really wasn't anybody there looking out for me. Um, you know, I prayed and things like that or meditated or whatever. And it, and it kind of felt like, okay, well, if there's somebody out there, I don't think they're really, I don't know that they're involved or they're making a sandwich or something while I'm upset. I never, I never, you know, I never, I never feeling, you know, people say, Oh, I just feel somebody there to comfort me. There was nothing there for me. Did you feel like there, was there ever a specific moment um, that you really stopped believing altogether? Or was there a incident that sort of precipitated that? I think that I always carried a, um, a little kernel of doubt, um, from the time I was very young. And that was why I asked a lot of questions because there were a lot of things that didn't make sense to me uh, morally, ethically. And the fact that God seemed to help people very unevenly. You know, I remember when I was a little kid and you would see commercials or people would talk about, you know, eat your dinner because there's starving kids. And, and I was like, okay, but, but we're praying for those starving kids. And obviously God is ignoring them, but I live in a four bedroom house in Southern California with a pool. And I've been to Disneyland three times this year. How come, you know, how come God is, is giving me my little ponies, but they're not feeding these kids. And so there was always that little bit of doubt in my head, but I, um, it was really scary to think to, for me to realize that there might not be somebody there because, or something there, because that was always like, that was the, that was the big thing. You had to believe in something. You had to believe in God. It's the only thing you ever had to do. And um, so I was afraid to let go of that belief. When I really got to the point where I let it go was when my nephew was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, he was two. And we went through six years of treatments. And there's a lot of up and downs with cancer treatment if you've you know, ever gone through it where, you know, you have hope and then you're scared and then you have hope and then you're scared. And I was very helpless in that. There was nothing I could do physically. I, I, and there were some issues within uh, the relationships surrounding my nephew. And so it wasn't like I had a lot of access to him. So I couldn't even like, you know, play with him or hold his hand or do anything like that. So the only option I had there was to pray. So I prayed and I prayed that, you know, God would give me the cancer. God would take me somehow, you know, I can bargain with him. Anything you want me to do, I'll go join a convent, anything, because, you know, you hear these stories, um, about the treatments, which are just horrific, um, and painful. And all I wanted to do was help and make it better. And I had nothing to do but pray. Um, and it wasn't just me praying. It was everybody praying. It was, you know, prayer groups and international and, you know, all this stuff. And when he passed, I was angry. I was very angry. Um, and I was, and that was when my belief really cracked, cracked to the point where I started to um, research. I believe the very first book I read and I, I got it from the library. I don't know the author. It was called Science of the Soul. I wanted to know, everybody's talking about him in heaven now. He's in heaven. He's gone on. He's in a better place. This was all part of a big plan. So my first thought was, well, is there a soul? So I went looking for the evidence of a soul. Um, and 
every time I read and every book I, I led into, I came up with there really isn't. And um, there wasn't any, I, I didn't find anything at all that, that really confirmed anything that I believed uh, to the point where I was like, you know, there is, um, it, I am an atheist. I don't believe anymore. Uh, there was no way for me to, to mesh the science that I was learning with a benevolent person that was looking over everything. Um, because it just didn't make sense. In fact, I ended up finding more comfort in letting go of the belief in God than the belief in God I had, because it was much more of a relief to me to know that there wasn't somebody that planned for this child to be born and have two years of a normal life. And then literally spend six years of horrible treatments, um, not knowing what was going to happen to them. And I'll, and if that was somebody's plan, then that wasn't somebody that I had any respect for. <laughs> that wasn't somebody who was benevolent. That wasn't somebody that had good intentions or anything. And it was actually more of a relief for me to believe that he didn't exist or that it didn't exist. Um, then to think that somebody planned this and there was some sort of, um, you know, higher meaning behind it. I, I just, I was done trying to square that. Um, but it, it was a long time coming. That was really the catalyst. That was really the straw for me is when I started looking. So, and then of course I kept my mouth shut for a while because that wasn't something that I could share with people because everybody around me is telling me he's in heaven. It's part of a plan. Um, we just got to trust in the plan. So this was even your family who had previously not been very heavily religious. You, you even knew among them that this was going to be an unwelcome revelation. Oh, definitely. Wow. Definitely. In fact, it wasn't something until just really a few years ago when I started. Um, I think when I went to the Freedom from Religion Foundation and I had written an article for their newsletter and then obviously I was excited because I was like, oh, look, I published this article. And that was when my family started to get a whiff of what I was becoming involved in. And um, that was when I started to understand that I really needed to be careful what I said or I was going to start damaging relationships there. Um, and this was after them having dealing with my dancing, um, you know, which had kind of faded. I'm sure that there were mumblings when I wasn't there about that, but that was something that I had got used to, but I was terrified to tell them that I no longer believed in God. Absolutely terrified, which turns out to be pretty justified. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was, it was awful, but, but yeah, no. And, and part of it was that I didn't want to, um, they were finding comfort in it. So even though I wasn't finding comfort in it, they were. And so I, I you know, I was very cognizant of not wanting to, to take that. Um, I didn't want to take that away from them because it was just such a painful thing in our family. Um, but yeah, when I start, when they found out that I had become involved with uh, FFRF, that was when things kind of started to go south with my family. And I, I, that was when they started to figure it out, even though it had been probably a good, maybe 10 years um, before that, that I had been an atheist or that I understood that I was an atheist. So it wasn't really, uh, you didn't start feeling um, uh, some animosity from your family. Uh, um, it wasn't the dancing that the, your family didn't approve of. It was you, your disbelief that your family started dis disapproving of. Wow. And it, and it wasn't even that, um, that I was irreligious. Um, and that's one of the things uh, in my book, I talk about how you must believe in something because it wasn't that I wasn't Catholic. It wasn't that I wasn't Christian. It wasn't um, that I didn't adhere to a certain organized religion. It was, well, you just don't believe in anything at all. And that was kind of like the fart at the dinner table. It wasn't that I wasn't going to church because because nobody went to church. I don't know anyone in my family that, that goes to church regularly. Um, so it wasn't really an organized religion thing. It was a, well, you just, you have to believe in something. That was really the big, the big thing. And, and I actually find that much outside of my family, even with my friends, other dancers, um, you know, whether it be any type of 
higher power. That's always what they say or spiritual thing that um, it's just that you don't believe in anything is when people start to, to have a bit of a, a problem. Yeah, exactly. Um, I really love how you kind of described uh, your whole experience because the way you've described it is it mirrors um, so much of what I've experienced just personally, but also from the folks that I've heard talk in this in the support groups throughout the years, um, uh, how hollow it felt praying, um, how uh, looking around at other people seeming to have some sort of spiritual experience that I'm not uh, experiencing. And then also this, uh, uh, when folks, when family members and friends can't understand why you no longer believe in um, any in a higher power at all, and start to uh, think that you've come, you're a different person now. I really, really loved how you described all that. It just it's so so perfect. Thank you very much for sharing that. Well, and um, when it comes to being a, a dancer, there are things where you know people tend to be a little more open about it. It's easier to I can stand there and I can tell them you know, Hey, I'm not a drug addict. I'm not, you know, my, my boyfriend isn't on that couch smoking pot and playing guitar. You know, I'm not, I didn't just do a line in the bathroom, you know, that kind of thing. And they're looking at me, they can see me, they can see that I'm generally put together and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and so it's, it's easier to dispel that face to face um, and I had gotten, I had adjusted to that. I, I was used to kind of defending my position and being like, Hey, look, I'm not, you know, what you saw in Dr. Phil, I'm actually fairly well adjusted. And, you know, when it comes to telling people that you are a non-believer, it is very much different. Um, because people so much attach morality and ethics to believing in something, anything that it's very hard to tell them that for some reason, you know, I, especially people that have known me for 20 years, that's what really shocked me is that it's like, okay, well, I don't believe in a higher power, but I'm still the same person that I was. Um, but now I, you know, all of a sudden they have these, these preconceived notions that I am evil or, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing to hold me back from going around and, you know, just lopping people's heads off with an ax or, you know, sacrificing puppies to Satan. It's like, but you, I'm the same person I was 30 seconds ago, but now all of a sudden, um, you know, every decent thing I've ever done in my whole life means nothing. Um, and so I found that it, it was really the stigmas that surround the word atheist, um, parallel some of the things that surround stripping and adult entertainment but almost worse because it's harder to dispel those they're so deeply ingrained um i think more than the stigmas that relate to sex work or adult entertainment well talk to us a little bit about that what um what are some of the like what are some of the I can, what are some of the stigmas you experienced um, as a, as a dancer? Like what, what, what do you feel that you went through that was so similar uh, to your experience of coming out? Um, a, a lot of what was similar was, like I said, really just the, the judgments that people will make before you, you know, that either, I think one of the biggest ones with dancing is that, um, I might have come from a broken home or I have, um, I mean, I guess I did technically. Um, but it, I think the drugs thing is the biggest one um, that I'm an addict, that I was abused um, or trafficking. Sometimes actually one of the things that really got me into writing is a dancer that I worked with when I first started. She, um, she was a little on the wild side. She did a lot of drugs. Um, she made a lot of, poor choices. And then she found, um, Jesus and that was, her, you know, um, his plan for her and all that stuff. And, um, she started an outreach group and she basically started spreading this misconception that dancers were trafficked, um, that were traffic wow. victims that were kidnapped off the street and forced to go on stage, which is ridiculous. Um, especially because she knew it wasn't true. And so she was 
basically perpetuating those stigmas and stereotypes because it helped her in her mission. It helped her uh, proselytize. It helped her gain support. And um, so that was one of the reasons why I started writing in the first place, because she, she knew that wasn't true and was putting it all out there. And that was how I started to fight those stigmas. Now, when I started to come out as an atheist, and I realized that I was starting to be confronted with the same type of stereotypes and stigmas, such as, you know, worshiping Satan, such as I must be a bad person. I must have no problems with lying. I have no morals. Where do I get my, um, you know, why my life must have no meaning now, which I, th I think is really mean. Um, or, uh, that I, um, uh, you know, that I can't, I can't love. I don't feel love. I mean, mm. there are so many really awful things that go along with, with simply not being, um, a believer. And like I said, that goes beyond, um, it really goes beyond religion and into any type of spirituality. You know, all of a sudden people can't understand why, um, you know, why I bother living at all if there's no God. And I'm like, well, that's, it's really kind of harsh if you think about it. And it's very difficult to refute those things because it's scary with dancing. I think it's easier to dispel those because it isn't, it's not something that is so deeply ingrained that you can convince people that it isn't, um, you know, it's not scary to think that maybe a dancer could be normal and, and well-adjusted and pay their bills and, you know, that kind of a thing. Whereas if you don't believe in God, and you were raised to think that people that don't believe in God are evil and they're going to go to hell or they're Satanists, which of course is kind of an oxymoron, but, um, it, it's, it's, it frightens them. I think it's very scary to tell people, um, who, who base their entire lives or think they base their entire lives on, um, a God belief or a religion that you don't believe in anything. And I, I think it really frightens them. Um, so that's a little different than dancing. It's much more extreme. Yeah, that's really yeah. an interesting point that you bring up about if people are thinking that, you know, how, how could you have meaning in your life or want to live or have love or anything, you know, how much of a crutch they must be using this, this belief system for if, if they've never imagined that, that they could have meaning in their life or have morals or be able to make ethical decisions without it. It really, yeah, it, it makes sense to me what you say that it must be very scary to think what life would be like without that if all of a sudden you have to be responsible for all of those things. Well, and that is actually the exact tactic that her outreach group and, and not just the outreach group um, that the woman, I don't think she's actually does that anymore. So I don't want to be saying something that's not true anymore. I think she's out of it now, but that type of group, there's another one called the hookers for Jesus, um, which the cougars is for Jesus. Jesus. There is, there's hookers for Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> actually, uh, we talked about it on, um, <laughs> uh, with, uh, Dan Barker and Annie Laurie Gaylor, um, <laughs> who are two of the nicest and most lovely people you will ever meet. So to hear them say repeatedly hooker and stripper um, was, was interesting. It was hard to hold it together during that show. But there, um, <laughs> we talked about that a little bit. Um, I think they had gotten a government grant. Um, but they very much used that tact where, uh, don't you want to be loved? Don't you want to be respected? That's where I had somebody come up to me um, and say that. Don't you want somebody to love you? As if, number one, I'm a stripper, so nobody loves me and I don't. Nobody respects me, which is a really rotten thing to say, but their greater meaning was I can't have love in my life or be loved if I don't love Jesus, which I found really foul, um, a really disgusting thing to say to somebody. But they use that as a tact to try to rescue women um, that are dancing. So basically wow. they're pushing both points. One is you can't be happy without God and you can't possibly um, live a responsible or respectful or happy life being an adult entertainer. So she really, I guess we're kind of polar opposites in that respect. Um, the lady that worked for that outreach group is where she kind of used both of those things to further her own agenda, which I think a lot of was, was guilt driven driven. I think she felt bad about the choices she made as a dancer. And I think she found a way to, um, 
justify that and to take the responsibility of her choices off her shoulders by saying it was part of a greater plan. Now, now I remember, and I, I've, I've been on kind of both sides of this, both as, as a believer and as a non-believer, that um, when I was a believer and I kind of met an atheist, I'm like, oh, I know, I, of course I can convert this person to Christianity. And then when I'm no, when I was an atheist and no longer a believer, I'd have people who felt the same way. Like, oh my gosh, this guy, I have all of the answers and I can definitely um, talk to him and, and uh, get him back into the fold. Now, while you were working, um, did you have a similar experience? Did you have clients who would try and um, uh, convert you um, uh, as a dancer? Um, I didn't talk about it a lot with customers unless I knew that it was going, cause I'm in a, it, when I'm talking to a customer, they're a customer. And so my objective in that situation is to make income. So definitely be very careful about, um, how I would express that to somebody. So the topic didn't come up a lot. And then when it did, it was with, um, customers that I was I already knew I was comfortable with, um, now, there were dancers that certainly wanted to at least, they wanted to not convert me, but they wanted to, me to be convinced that there was um, a higher power or spiritual, whatever, not necessarily Christian, um, but there were definitely dancers and one manager in particular that wanted me to believe in something or wanted to convince me to believe in mm. something. Um, but very rarely did I have customers that really said anything. I think I told, I think I was talking to somebody um, about, I was reading uh, Carl Sagan's book um, at the time. And he said, oh, Sagan, that's a slippery slope. And it was, definitely. Yeah. Very slippery. But, uh, you know, so I, I let, uh, you know, so I moved on from that conversation because I'm financially motivated when I'm talking to somebody. So I certainly wasn't going to start an argument about something like that. Uh, or I wasn't going to, you know, I would just kind of gloss over it and let it go. So you kind of felt like, uh, um, and I'll, I'll be honest, I had a similar feeling too. It sounds like you felt like if people sort of uh, started to find out that you were a non-believer, that you're, income would drop uh, quite a bit, like your livelihood was at risk. Certainly in some instances, I mean, it, you know, it, it depended, but uh, yeah, it wasn't something I was going to bring up. The same thing with politics. If, if I'm talking to somebody, I think I danced for it very briefly, a lobbyist um, from Texas. Well, obviously I'm going to avoid politics with that guy um, because I know that we are coming from very opposite sides. <laughs> And so I don't want to, I, you know, I'm going to kind of ho-hum and I'm going to change the subject and start talking about my cat. Actually, it's pretty much my go-to. <laughs> when things got, when things got sticky, I would, I would start, you know, bring up something soft, but, um, other than customers that I, that I might've had regularly that I became more close with, have more in-depth philosophical conversations, but I don't think any one of them was any type of a, um, a religious believer. So then what, where did you go from there? What kind of uh, takeaways did you learn for dealing with, with talking to people about these issues? Did you find that certain things were, were successful for you uh, for, for discussing this time, type of thing? Um, outside of my work, because like I said, with my work, you know, conversations very much depended on this, the context. And, um, you know, like I said, they were, they were, financially driven. So, but what I noticed was after I, um, became open about being an atheist and after I became involved in the community, um, writing and volunteering a little bit for, um, FFRF. And of course I'm, you know, wanting to talk to my friends and family and I'm like, Oh, well, you know, I'm doing this thing. This is exciting or this happened or that happened. And they would be like, okay. Um, so you wait, you're an atheist. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, yeah, actually I am. Um, and I had always been pretty open, especially with my friends 
uh, and family about dancing. And so although I found that it was kind of uncomfortable and I had um, pretended for a while or at least, you know, kind of hid my atheism or maybe just didn't talk about it that much, um, I felt like I kind of had to be open about it. And um, I really tried to be as understanding and diplomatic as I could when I started to talk to family and friends about, um, about not believing. So basically I would get, you know, a lot of the same types of questions, um, you know, well, how do you find meaning in life and, and things like that. And I tried to handle it, um, sort of the way that I did dancing where you, ask the person who knows you to say, but you know who I am. You see me, you see that I'm a good person. I, I donate when I can. I, you know, we host parties and I give and, um, I'm a regular blood donor and, you know, I'll help you move, you know, I'm not very big, but you know, I can move the little things. And, um, and so before, it kind of basically, before we, uh, move, whose oh. blood did you donate? Was it like a, just a five oh, gallon yeah. bucket of blood that you brought in? <laughs> yes. No, it was my own. It was my oh, own. okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, but I really tried to get people to see me as me and be like, you know what? I, I am the same person that I was, you know, 20 seconds ago. Um, there isn't anything about me that has changed. Um, and I think that when you have a personal relationship with somebody, that's a little easier than it is to um, tell a stranger that you're an atheist Um, because then those, um, those preconceived stigmas and stereotypes come in where, you know, Oh, well, you must be a bad person. You know, you must be stealing or robbing banks on the weekend or, you know, what is stopping you from, you know, um, being a rotten person So I think for me, the biggest thing was just having those open discussions, but trying to understand that somebody on the other side, looking at um, me as a person, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes where I was when I was a believer, um, that they find comfort in that. And so trying to be understanding that people may still kind of need that in their lives. Um, and not trying to, you know, argue the physics or the semantics, um, or things like that, that come around, um, the ideas of, of God, um, and basically just trying to take it more on a personal level. And I found that the people who, you know, that really want to understand and want to keep having a relationship and things like that will, you know, find that out and, love you anyway. And if you have to disagree, then that's okay. Um, but there are certainly people that don't, um, you know, that aren't there, they're, they're not ready to do that. So my, um, my approach was to try to be as kind as possible, unless of course I was being attacked and then it makes it, then it makes it a little more difficult to be nice. Um, if you feel like somebody's being just mean, that's, that is really cool that you went through that. Like I, ha- I had a very similar experience to um, up to the point in which um, you know started to interacting with folks. Um, when I left and, or lost my um, whole belief system, like, like you, I just devoured um, books and, and podcasts and videos as much as I could. And it really took me finding a community of like-minded people to feel more comfortable in expressing ideas uh, and being able to explain where I uh, was coming from. Um, and that, that kind of gave me power and that gave me more courage. But unlike you, I was angry. And uh, I kind of went through this angry atheist phase where I was more on the defense uh, or no, I was more doing uh, attacking, I feel, than really kind of um, uh, handling it the way you handle it, which is so much better than the way I I handle it. I definitely went through that at first, um, especially with... um, when I became involved with FFRF, it had to do with my son's school. 
And um, I definitely went to the point where I was, because I felt like it was affecting him at that point. Um, and so I went through the angry atheist phase. Ev- definitely. Um, I think you could go through my Twitter um, timeline and, and probably <laughs> find that. <laughs> but it's different with, for me, it was different with people personally in my life um, because I'm talking to people I care about um, and they care about me as opposed to strangers on the internet or strangers. It's the same thing with, with dancing where when I was, <laughs> I was, I had gone to the bank to make a deposit and I hadn't been able to cash in all my ones. And so I had a huge, huge stack of ones. And of course I'm standing in line and there's a lady who asked me, um, you know, we were just talking and she's like, Oh, what do you do? And I said, Oh, well, I'm a dancer. And she says, Oh, ballet. And I'm like, no exotic. And of course she's, you know, looks like she's, I just spit in her face. So she turns around and she's like freaking out. And I'm like, I'm holding a stack of ones. And so I, I, um, I could have chosen in that point to deal with her in a more um, soft manner and, and, you know, and said, Hey, well, I'm an adult entertainer and try to explain it to her and all that stuff. And I didn't, I kind of smacked her in the face with it. And I knew she was going to react the way that she reacted. And so I think that there are certain times um, when I've definitely poked the bear and, and not, and not been kind But as I've grown, I've realized that there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of fear around coming out as a non-believer. And I really try to come from that point and look at it from the other person's point of view that they may be scared and hell may be a, a, a more real thing. The more, um, I'm exposed to other people's experiences that are leaving religion. And I see some of the really scary things that they've been through and the things that they've taught, um, or been taught and that they believe, you know, if I'm talking to somebody who really thinks that I might go to hell, I want to be, I want to approach them with a certain kindness and understand that they really are frightened. Um, me personally, hell was a concept, but it was always, if you are a good person, you're not going to go there. So I would, I never really had that really like crushing fear of hell or judgment or punishment like that. But I understand that other people do. Um, and so that's where I try to come from a place of understanding where they're coming from, that they may be really be afraid. Um, Gosh, I, I'd love that. I, I was so selfish and I still kind of have Mary now and then, and just hearing you talk about, just look at it from the other point of view, re- remind uh, yourself uh, that you were there once too, and, and kind of think about how, you would have reacted to someone uh, talking to you this way. I, I really appreciate that because I'm still kind of a jackass when it comes to I And uh, to be more. totally honest, I can be too, for sure. If, if somebody is, um, and especially when, as it relates to my son, um, if somebody is going to come at me in that mode, I mean, they're probably going to get what they, um, you know, what they're dishing out. Um, but really when it comes to like my friends and things like that. And, and it goes beyond belief in God. There's, um, I have a a friend who, you know, is a big believer in, in certain supplements or natural paths or, um, certain things like pseudoscience that I may have actually even debunked in my book. And I'm like, Hey, would you, would you like a free (laughs) copy? Um, but if it's not going to hurt them, then I really try to, um, I just try to let that kind of thing go. Um, I had a friend of mine that posted something about some type of cleanse. So I, and I, and I almost reacted and I almost said, you know what? It's, you're just wasting your money. This is crap. But what I did was I went online. I looked at what they were taking. It was really expensive. Didn't look like there was going to hurt them. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to not choose to have this battle. And so when it comes to God and atheism, um, if somebody is getting something out of it, um, they're not being abusive or pushy or, you know, they can accept me, then I try to accept them as, as I can, but I'm far from perfect (laughs) in that respect. Um, definitely. And especially when it involves my son. But I really do like how you emphasize that 
kindness piece of it. Like in, in your way of thinking about the conversations, you're putting the people first rather than the ideas, which is kind of the opposite sometimes of what's happening when people are maybe trying to ask you, you know, how could it be that, you know, you even feel like you have meaning or love in your life without this? It's almost like the complete opposite perspective of minimizing and diminishing the person in an effort to get them on board with the belief system. Whereas your approach kind of reminds me of um, when uh, Anthony Magna Bosco came and talked to us about street epistemology, kind of the same thing, this idea of, well, what good is it to win the argument if it's hurting a person or taking away something that is keeping them going right now? Uh, it's, it's really just a lot more people focused uh, approach to things. And I, I think that's really significant what you said there that, okay, yeah, we're not perfect. We get angry. I get angry all the time. I've been accused of the angry atheist stuff too. But I mean, just coming from a position of trying to be kind to people rather than win the argument seems, I mean, I think that's, pretty big. I don't think that you're going to, I don't think that you can win anybody over if you're going to attack is in the same way that a Christian might tell me, Oh, repent, you're going to go to hell or this or that or whatever. Uh, that's not going to work on me walking up to me in a strip club and telling me that nobody loves me or respects me. It's not going to work. Um, and I, I can't say that I was very kind to that particular person, but I also, I knew ahead of time where she was coming from. I knew she was coming from that group. Um, and I used to be, when that group would come into our, um, our club, they would bring little gift bags and set them all up on the bar. And I would make sure that they would see me pick up my gift bag and walk it directly to the garbage and throw it away. Um, because I wanted them to know that it was inappropriate. They, they shouldn't have been doing that and coming in and invading our space, um, with the message that they're giving the other girls, these girls don't need to hear that they're broken and that they're bad and that they're sinners. And they are actually after the hookers for Jesus thing. I wrote a, I wrote a, a blog on my website. Um, Jesus is your pimp because they're basically asking you to bow down and give yourself to somebody else while saying that you have already, um, you know, that you, that's what you're doing as a dancer. And it's like, no, that's, you know, you, you're basically asking to, to trade one um, submission for another. Um, but I just don't think you're going to reach anybody that way. And I think one of the biggest turning points for me when it came to um, trying to accept believers was actually as my mom, um, before she passed, we were in the hospital and my mom was a closeted agnostic. She admitted it to me. Um, but nobody else, I really wish she'd have said it to anyone else in my family. Cause now it just sounds like I'm just saying that. Um, but we had a priest come in because we knew that she would want the last rites. Um, we had taken her off life, life support. So I was there with my, my stepfather, my father and my siblings. And, you know, the priest is there. And of course, everybody knows I'm this horrible atheist, but I held the hands of the priest and, um, I told him, I said, I, you know, I'm not a believer. And he says, you don't have to be. And I held his hands and I did what my mother wanted. And I could see that it was bringing at least some sort of comfort to the rest of my family. And, and that's what it was. He came and spoke at her memorial and, um, they needed that comfort. That was not the time to, you know, say, Hey, this guy's probably diddling little kids. I don't think he, I mean, I have no idea, but you know what I'm saying? That wasn't the time to be angry atheists. That was the time to come together and, and be supportive. And that was not a time to, um, to challenge people's beliefs. That was a time to let them have it. I think actually Judy said, um, when we talked about this wonderful, wonderful lady, um, she said, you don't ever want to pull the rug out from somebody. Um, and my takeaway from that what she said was, um, you know, if it's not hurting them and they're finding it's helping them, it's, that's not the time to have that type of discussion. Oh, I, uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, that, that reminder because, um, every now and then I just get so in my own head and that it's all about me, me, me. And, uh, I want to make sure everybody knows the truth. Cause of course I'm on the right side of things. And just you reminding me of that is so helpful just to get me to step out of 
uh, my own head and, and think of others too. I really, really appreciate that. Um, so it sounds like uh, your sort of coming out was a long process in a sense, and you strategically um, uh, approached folks who you felt would be kind of safer uh, at first, maybe, uh, and then you kind of worked worked your way out, uh, down from there. Um, you want to uh, either talk to us a little bit about your process or possibly even give us some uh, tips of, for some folks who are wanting to come out or considering it? My, um, well, my first, even though I had um, probably considered myself an atheist for a few years at least before I actually really vocalized it um, or identified that way, um, finding you know, pages on social media, which of course has gotten a little scarier over the last few years. Um, but I started with, um, some atheist pages, actually, I think the friendly atheist, uh, Hemet, if we're familiar with him was my first, cause he's friendly, right. Um, <laughs> you know, he was very nice and, and he, and so, and then I, um, the freedom from religion foundation was something that really, um, caught my eye because they were really working to keep um, church and, and state separate, which was important for me. And um, when I went to the convention, it that was really kind of my epiphany. That was really my aha moment um, because I was surrounded by um, people that that were going to accept me that I didn't believe in religion. And it was like coming from a spot where, you know, you might go to a family dinner and we got to bow our heads, you know, with one eye open and being like, oh, hurry up. It, it wasn't like that. And um, actually, when I walked into the convention, I walked into the first speaker who happened to be Salman Rushdie, who I didn't know who that was. So I walked into him completely, completely ignorant of who that was. And then I had met the editor who was the only person I had known um, because he had accepted and published my, my article and he introduced me to Judy Saint and she invited me to come sit with her and Dan Barker's on state stage and he's playing his, his songs. And I'm like, Oh, and I look over to Judy and I was like, I had tears in my eyes because I felt like I had found like yeah. <laughs> my home. And that's what I said to her. And she knew that I was a dancer and she, there was no real judgment there. And so I, I looked at her and she, go, and she says to me, she says, you are home. And I think that was really what gave me the confidence to, to feel like I wasn't alone, but also that I could speak out. And then the more I learned, I felt like I should speak out, um, so that I could help other people have that epiphany and have that moment that I did where I wasn't alone. And it may be, um, it may be that that is the only type of community that you can be in for right now. And, and maybe you're at a job or you're with your family and you're not comfortable being able to say that you're a non-believer, but there are a lot of communities, different organizations, FFRF, like I said, is more on the legal side, but there's humanist organizations, there's local groups, um, and things like that, that can really give you that sense of community, especially, especially if you are leaving, um, a church type environment where you have that, that was why my mom never wanted to leave was because she loved that feeling of her friends in church. She would have never told any of them that she doubted, um, what she believed because that's what she wanted, but finding other like-minded people, um, to know that you're not alone in times where you might have felt very alone at the family dinner or sitting in church and things like that. I love that. Yeah, I remember when I first realized I was I no longer believed. I felt incredibly alone, and I felt that way for several years um, until I kind of got the courage up to actually look. Uh, for a community. And this was in the Midwest, very, very conservative area of the Midwest. And um, I will never forget the very first, uh, the Springfield Freethinkers was the very first secular community group that I kind of walked into. And 
Um, you know, I, I sweat a lot normally because it's super humid and hot in Missouri, but there in that library room with the air conditioning on, I was sweating bullets. I had no idea what to expect. I was super nervous, but plugging into that local community um, really helped me, help ground me. And so I'm really glad that you gave that bit of advice. It's um, perfect. And so that was how, what I experienced too, finding a an alternative a, a replacement community for my old uh, old one. Definitely. And even if it's just a safe space, although the one thing that I have found um, as I have been more open, and especially because I'm, you know, I'm on the internet and I'm a book and things like that. Um, so everybody pretty much knows is um, I think what really surprised me is how many people are closeted atheists. Um, that are just really afraid to say it. And so sometimes I'll have somebody being like, oh my God, I am too, but I could never tell anybody. <laughs> and, and then it's like, you know, that you have that connection with that person. And um, I think that sometimes when we do get wrapped up in ourselves and our own lives, we um, it's really easy to think that there isn't other people out there like you. Um, even if it's, yeah. even if it's, it's dancing. I mean, there were certain times, like even dancers that are Christians or Wiccans or whatever the hell they do. Um, we still have that connection because we know what it's like to have people judge us for what we do and to think things about us that aren't true. And I think that's really the same with any type of marginalized type community where it can be really easy to feel like you're the lone ranger and there's nobody out there. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of people in the world, like billions of people in the world. And um, you can find somebody that has gone through something similar and you can find that connection with somebody. And even if it's just one person that will at least help you not feel, um, you know, like you're going this whole thing by yourself, you know, and there's a lot of different types of atheist community. I think that's the one thing they always say, which is funny because, um, DJs, DJs used to say the same thing about strippers is that it's like herding cats, you know, you can't ever get them all together. And, um, <laughs> As atheists, the one thing that we have in common or non-believers or free thinkers or whatever is, is just that, that's it. And so there are a lot of different types of communities. It doesn't have to be a political atheist community. It doesn't have to be uh, an activist community. It could just simply be, you know, a book club or a friend or a neighbor or something like that, that can provide you that kind of support um, that can understand what you're going through. But we're like cats too, you know, everybody is, everybody's different, everybody has their own components and uh, non-belief is just one of them, but there are a lot of different groups that can provide that, um, that feeling of support and camaraderie. Yeah, and I would uh, add to that, um, there are a lot of bad atheist groups out there too, so um, if, uh, and I didn't have this experience luckily, but there are, uh, if, if you kind of find yourself in a group that you just don't like, it's okay to leave it. It's okay to uh, keep looking. Um, it's not a one shot and you're done type of thing. There is a ton of uh, different communities out there. So if you happen to get into a group uh, that is full of awful people, like misogynistic, homophobic incels, then get out of there and um, find somebody a lot, uh, or another group that's a lot better. Um, I mean, unless of course you're a homophobic incel, <laughs> then, you know, that might be your group. <laughs> oh my gosh. I hope no, uh, I know, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not a big um, real group person. I don't personally, I don't really like being put into, um, I don't really like being confined in that respect. Mm. Um but definitely when it comes to something that feels, you know, if you're surrounded by um, believers or things like that, I think finding even just one person um, to be able to connect to that can understand what you're going through is, is, is worth it and is important, um, at least in that type of validation so that you can feel like you aren't the only person that thinks that way, um, as opposed to getting caught up with, you know, some of the... Um, any type of group that can be um, limiting. They want you, you know, I want everybody to be the same. And, you know, bottom line is we're all a little bit different. 
Yeah. Well, what, is, what are some other um, tips for some folks who are uh, thinking of coming out? Um, I guess my tips would be to, you know, start with the people that um, you're closest with and that you are most certain will be open to listening to you. Somebody that may know that you are, um, that you are a good person, that, that is not going to throw some of those stereotypes in your face. I know that when I was a dancer, my mother was really, um, the person that I was closest to. And so she was the first, she was the first person I told because she was the easiest person I told, um, that the person that I knew would accept me no matter what. So, um, I would definitely, if you're feeling like you need to come out, I think that the best thing to do is to start with the, the concentrated group of friends. Um, obviously you don't want to walk into the office and say, you know, fuck God, I'm an atheist. Um, you know, it's probably <laughs> a bad idea. You might want to start small, <laughs> you know? Um, and the other thing is to try to, it's hard, but I think that one of the most important things is to not come across as proselytizing, like, you know, somebody that has done to you, you know, if you treat people with respect, they are going to be more likely to treat you with respect. But I think understanding that telling people that you don't believe in God or, or um, that you've left a religion, that those people may be afraid and that you might need to understand and try to put themselves, put yourself in their shoes so that they might be more willing to put themselves in yours and understand where you're coming from. I like that. Um, if I uh, may make sort of a caveat, um, we, when we have some folks who are in the support groups that come to us, like, I, I really want to be like true to myself and kind of come out. And, and, uh, the, the, the one thing that I usually say to them is like, make sure that it's safe for you to come out first. If you are dependent on someone um, who is like, whether it's financially or if it's for a home or if it's for college or even like food, um, if it's if you think it's not safe for you to come out because um, you have run a high risk of losing your livelihood or being kicked out, then um, I think that uh, I'd, I'd recommend <laughs> holding off until you are self-sustained and uh it's a little safer at that point um, is, is, how does that sound to you Erin oh absolutely I mean and that's I think that's what I was um trying to get at when I meant start with people that you trust and people that you are close with um and definitely start with that nuclear thing. But when it comes to, I mean, you know, I was taught, you know, talk about money, politics and religion. And I think that in generally speaking, especially when you're talking about a work environment or something like that, you know, you're not going to go to the movies and, and tell everybody in the audience that you're an atheist. I mean, I, I think there's a certain, um, there's a certain decorum certainly that you want to be with, but you know, when it comes up, um, and you're in a circle of friends and somebody's talking about it and they, and they um, are talking about religion or belief, you know, I think it can be a very freeing thing to say, you know, I'm not a believer. And, um, and I think the way that you present yourself is, is a lot of times is what you're going to, what you're going to get back. But certainly if um, I have a, a friend of mine that I met who's in, uh, Georgia and she wanted to start a uh, atheist group and, you know, got followed home, um, and threatened. So obviously, you know, there are certain places I'm in California, so it's, it's, it's probably a little easier than somebody that's in the Bible belt. So definitely safety is, um, something you need to take into consideration. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, it's not, being dishonest to not bring up a difficult conversation that's going to put you in danger. That's, you know, that's, that's a different thing. You're, you're not actively tricking people. It sounds like is what you're saying here. You're 
protecting yourself from having those negative conversations that would be distressing to the other person as well, right? Well, definitely. And it isn't, um, you know, it feels good to be able to be honest um, with people and to be who you are and, and things like that. But there's a context. And I think, especially when it comes to beliefs and belief systems, um, you know, like for me, like I, it, in my book, I talk about, um, chiropractors and I'm, you know, not something that I, I feel is a worthy thing, but if I'm talking to a friend of mine and they're telling me how much their chiropractor help them, well, I'm not going to take that opportunity to say, well, you know, the chiropractic theory came from a ghost story and, you know, I'm probably going to let that go. Now, if we're in a different conversation and they're saying, oh, well, what do you think about chiropractic? So yeah, well, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little history lesson. So I, you know, I think a lot of it just boils down to natural social interaction. Um, and I think that atheism, I actually was a little prickly when I first heard the term coming out of the closet um, in terms of atheism, because I thought, well, that's a lot different than the LGBT community um, because it isn't it isn't something that's always out there. It's not necessarily part of your daily life. I don't need to go to a teacher student meeting um, for my kid and be like, Oh, by the way, I'm an atheist. What church do you go to? You know what I'm saying? I mean, there are times when I think you just need to to take that, but I think it's a little different than, um, and that's why I was so, and in Judy, once again, my muse, my mentor, um, she, talk to me. And she said, no, that is okay, because it is part of your personality and who you are. Um, but I didn't want to feel like it's not, it, I just, I felt like it was a little different. Um, because there are some contexts when we're just not talking about religion, you know, we may be going to a sports game, we may be going to the movies or whatever. So maybe it's not necessarily um, an appropriate time. So I think the context of the conversation really matters. I think that's a really great point that you make there. I've heard other people mention that too. And I had a similar feeling when I first heard that term about coming out as an atheist. And I kind of wondered about that too. And I kind of landed where you did as well with, you know, kind of this idea that yes, there are similarities to it and it's okay for there to be lots of other groups of people that we acknowledge are also marginalized and face other struggles that are different than ours. It's, it's not a contest of who's the most oppressed, who's, who's got it the worst. I think kind of the way you've been presenting this is this is an opportunity to connect with people when it's appropriate and put people first in your interactions. And I really like how you've foregrounded that throughout all of your comments here. I think that is so helpful. Um, and one of the other things I was kind of thinking of is um, one of the reasons I kind of wanted to also come out when I felt safe and prepared and ready to do that um, was actually to kind of be an example, almost like what you had, what you had said earlier is like, kind of like be an example, like, look, um, atheists are everywhere, non-believers are everywhere. And if I can kind of be a, a stand in for some folks who are not yet ready to come out and not yet uh, feel safe enough to come out, um, just wanted to be an example, like, look, you're not alone. Uh, uh, because again, going back to what I had said earlier, I had felt so alone when uh, I first came out. And so I kind of wanted to come out for other folks uh, as well and, and for their benefit. Yeah. I think that for me, I felt um, maybe a little more responsible or even obligated in some sense to be open about it um, because I had dealt with so many, uh, I, you could probably imagine uh, some of the comments I've gotten for being a dancer um, and some of that stuff that I've had to deal with there. And I kind of felt like because I had already been through that um, type of experience that I should sort of take one for the team in, in this respect also and be able to add that voice because I am safe in doing that. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to lose my job. Uh, my boss will kind of poke me every once in a while if it comes up, but he's not like, I, I'm not going to lose my job. Nobody's going to come in and hurt me. Um, I've heard some pretty awful things, but I am not afraid. And so I feel like I might be able to 
add to that voice and help direct and guide people to meet other atheists um, if they're not able to be open about it, if it is something that will affect them adversely to an extreme. Um, I kind of feel like I've, you know, taken a punch or two already. So, yeah. you know, um, I felt like it was important for me to speak out, but I definitely understand that not everybody can, they, they just can't. And hopefully as we progress and we get, um, it becomes more normalized and people see that we're not um, eating babies or running around murdering people um that eventually the recording before we do that part yeah we, yes. that's all. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um but hopefully hopefully we'll get to a point where it just isn't an issue where it's a who cares kind of a thing oh you don't believe in god no big deal um but for right now i think i think it's important for the people that can speak out safely to do so i, th- I think it really helps if you can if you can extend a hand and show somebody hey i'm out there and you know, I'm certainly not everybody's flavor. I know there's people that there may be other atheists that, you know, still aren't very fond of me or, or, or can't relate with me because of my job. And that's cool. But there, there will be somebody else for them too. And that's okay. And I might be somebody's flavor that might help them feel comfortable speaking out. So I think it really takes a lot of different types of people. And I am a different person. So hoping that I can add to the, to the voices and, and make things a little more normal and not so scary. Excellent. Um, Aaron, thank you so much for this conversation. I really, really appreciate it. Um, you provided us with a couple of resources. Um, so uh, Kara, while I get those resources into the chat, you wanna go ahead and start the, kick off the Q and A? Yes, absolutely. We've received several questions and uh, feel free if anybody has more questions, type those into the chat uh, and we'll get through as many as we can in the next uh, few minutes here. Um, And so the first one that we got, Aaron, was uh, wondering what kind of feedback did you get from fellow dancers after you started to become more visible as an atheist? Um, Very much depended on the dancer. Definitely, which is, I guess this is part of what almost made me speak out more because there was a certain type of, um, there was a certain type of camaraderie in the dressing room. We all dealt with, you know, people that kind of sucked. We had, um, you know, managers or, or staff or customers or whatever. So we all had this sort of thing in common. And when some people would find out that either I didn't believe in, first off, I've never worked in a strip club dressing room that wasn't haunted um, <laughs> ever. I didn't know that. <laughs> every single what? one. I swear to God, every single one is haunted. Hands what down. What are these hauntings? Is it like former employees or? Yes, usually, or my favorite one. And I actually saw this ghost um, after several tequilas and like, I think 12 hours of work. Um, there was a ghost that hung himself in a dressing room in Reno. Um, I guess it used to be a slaughterhouse. So then it's extra creepy. I am not <laughs> sure if that's actually true or not. I couldn't, I, oh, I tried no. to validate it when I wrote about it. Um, and I could not figure out if that was, I, if it actually was a slaughterhouse or not, but apparently there was somebody that hung himself in the dressing room. And I actually, um, of course it was a hallucination, but I actually walked in and, and saw him hanging there. And it's funny because I, what I saw was exactly how every single other dancer described it. Um, so when it came to other dancers, I got some prickly stuff. Um, and that was part of what my chapter, um, some strippers need Jesus is about is that some of them needed that feeling. And so I got some pushback from them and they, of course, were the ones that really kind of wanted to argue about it and things like that. But, um, I definitely got some of those, um, comments not so much on morality or ethics but more like they were more trying to convince me either that ghosts are real afterlife's are real um, essential oils will fix everything Um, you know you can get energy from the moon that will fix your chakras and that kind of stuff so it was more those types of things that people really tried to convince me of and then it was like um that kind of upset a bit of the rhythm. I had definitely had some bulls that, that would be standoffish for me after that. Um, and we're not pleased. (laughs) So. That is really interesting. I had no idea that there were these, uh, 
all of these haunted dressing rooms. <laughs> Every single one. Everyone. I'm, I'm excited yeah. to read your book now to get all of these backstories. That was those were the funnest chapters to 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 write actually with because I actually actively ghost hunted for about 15 years. Um what? but slamming lockers, um, you know, all sorts of stuff. But it definitely within dancers, there's a lot of um talk of like karma and you know all mm. those kinds of things so um it, there was coming out as an atheist or a non-believer especially in just the supernatural there was a lot of pushback there not necessarily christianity as you can imagine there's not a lot of fundamentalist strippers no so, a lot of cross tattoos <laughs> a couple of virgin marys but not a lot of girls that are actually going to church one or yeah. two that is so interesting. And I want to come back around to this ghost hunting thing here in a minute, but we do have a couple of more questions that we probably want to get through first. Um, someone else was asking, um, after hearing all of these uh, comments and conversations with people saying, you know, you must be a bad person if you're not a Christian anymore. Did you ever struggle with believing that you were a bad person uh, due to these different beliefs that you had or did not have anymore? Um, I didn't. I didn't. And maybe... I don't know if that's like a touch of narcissism, but I, I didn't, I, I always grew up with the idea. Um, and I'm not sure when my family switched from like hell belief and things like that, but I always grew up with the idea that if you were a good person, you didn't hurt people. You didn't actively steal and cheat and do those things, um, that you wouldn't lie. So I always, my ethics and my morals were separate from my God belief because I, was just, that was just who I was. Um, you know, I like to take care of animals and I, all that. So I never really felt like I was a bad person. Um, I think I struggled more with people thinking that I was a bad person, either from being a non-believer or a dancer. And I think that was my biggest struggle, but I never personally felt bad about myself or what I was doing. Mm. That's fantastic. Well, and I mean, you can really tell in, in your activism that, I mean, you've been really brave coming forward, you know, over and over again with these things. So that's, that's great that you've been able to, to not be affected negatively in that way and be able to come forward and put yourself out there. So other people can also see, oh, okay, she's, she's I, and I, I'm not sure that I can take the credit for that in particular, because it was just, I was never indoctrinated to believe those things. Um, in fact, I learned about people growing up that way. And that I find really concerning um, that people do feel that way because, you know, um, I think the last piece I wrote for FFRF had to do with how people will morph the God that they believe in. And that God actually that they believe in reflects who they are as a person, like my mom. The God my mom believed in wasn't the Catholic God she grew up with. It was, you know, it was her morals and ethics and being kind to people, people that have those God beliefs um, and think they're getting their morals from them. I believe that they're actually putting their morals and ethics on the belief that they created. Mm -hmm. So I think being a good person really comes from inside. And I think that religion kind of steps on that. Um, when they attribute kindness and goodness and morals to a deity, when it's really coming from you, if you're a butthead, you're going to be a butthead. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you have those, you know, it, it takes away um, not only the responsibility of being a bad person, but it also takes away the credit from you just being a good person because that's who you are. Yes, Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective on it. It sure is nice if the God you believe in happens to think all of the same things you do. Well, like the God that told that guy to touch my pussy. That's yes. it, so weird. That happened to be what he wanted to do. And his God was telling him to do it. I mean, just. So convenient. Terribly convenient. <laughs> wow. And that's that story's in your book. I, uh, is that right? <laughs> it is. Yeah. Hmm. Um, we got another question here, just uh, one or two more. Um, how do you maintain a close relationship with your former church members when you're no longer a believer? I was never really active in a church. Um, so I don't have any, um, I don't have any, like, I'm not sure that I have any friends that go to church. 
actually. Um, but I do have friends that are believers in God. And it is one of those things where it's just really a mutual respect. I respect what they believe, um, whether I think it's true or not, and vice versa. Um, I think it really just has to come down to, um, God, I hate this because it's so cliche, but it really is true is, is treating people the way that you want to be treated. Yeah. And if they aren't able to accept your non-belief, um, you, you both have to be able to, um, to be coming from the same place of respect. I think you actually, you nailed it um, in, in that sense. Like if, if your relationship is more about just like you too, um, the, the things that you have in common, just the, the admiration, the respect you have for one another, then it's going to naturally transition from uh, being church friends to just being friends, it sounds like. And um, on the converse of that, if there are folks who can't accept you for uh, no longer being a believer, then it may not be worth it to try and continue to be those friend with uh, that friends with that person too. But you know, obviously that's a very individual. Uh, that's uh, a hard decision. decision to make, but I think that, that it, there are instances where it's necessary, unfortunately. Well, we have one final question. Um, so uh, let's say I'm coming out of a very strict religion that looks down upon sex work. What do you think I could do that, um, to help, uh, as I'm coming out of that religion, what do you think I could do to help get over that stigma, get over that judgmental nature um, that I kind of was uh, growing up with? Talk to a sex worker. Um, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. So meet, I mean, I wish I could take credit for it. Um, but, you know, I think that one of the, it's funny because I was actually just talking to somebody, um, we were talking about racism and we were talking about the movie, uh, the movie American History X came up, which is, um, that's a rough movie to watch. But yeah, that person had went into prison, right? He went into prison with preconceived notions and what happened for him to be able to humanize um, black people as a, you know, skinhead Nazi was to spend time with that person. Um, because now he was in a position where he is interacting with that person and he's able to see them as a person. And he can see that this guy is a good guy and he was able to make friends with him. But I, the most important thing was the closeness was being able to relate with them. So if you sit down and talk to a dancer or um, a, a sex worker, or whatever, you will um, ultimately, you're going to be able to see them as human. But if you keep, if you're watching porn and you're trying to be like, oh, well, I need to make this okay in my head, but it's not okay in your head, that's probably not going to work because it's not a, it's not a human direct interaction. Um, I actually had a lot of, I was not fond of, prostitutes. I, I felt like they invaded my space. I, I, I didn't like what they did morally. I thought, oh, that's really icky. And um, I had an opportunity to meet a girl that worked at the Bunny Ranch. Um, off, I, a friend of mine was a performer up there, actually a comedian, and I met him. Or we went backstage and these girls were there. And I sat down and I had a conversation with this lady. And she wasn't an alcoholic. She wasn't a drug addict. She wasn't forced into it. She wasn't nothing. She worked at the legal brothel, loved her job, thought it was great, um, was a lovely, wonderful person. And I tell you what, it changed my idea of the profession because as a stripper, I looked, I looked down on women that had sex for money because that's not what I did. And I had these preconceived notions. And what changed that for me was sitting down and, and talking to somebody who was and realizing that they were not what I thought they were. Um, but I think having that real, it's hard to hate somebody. I think when you're talking to them face to face, um, and you're actually making an effort to understand where they're coming from. Um, and you see that, I think that's the easiest way to dispel those types of misconceptions that you might have in your head or those, those preconceived ideas that you have is just sit down and, and talk to somebody. God, that's amazing. That's so just fantastic advice. 
do something to humanize them. <laughs> this is a great and, and having a conversation with them is like the best way. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Aaron, um, that kind of wraps up the uh, Q&A part. Um, we're going to kind of go into uh, just the, the final conclusion here. And then after uh, we kind of wrap up RFRX, the, the, the show here, we'll, we have a hangout session after. And um, are you able to stay around for a, a few minutes and um, chat with some of the folks here? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you again so much. I really learned a lot and I'm so grateful to have you on and, and talking with us. Well, thank you for having me. It was a, it was a good time. So I was very happy to be here. Yeah, this has been great. I am so looking forward to reading these other chapters in your book as well. You gave us just a little teaser of some of these things. <laughs> I can't yeah. wait. I still want to find out more about this ghost hunting situation. <laughs> so yeah, this has been fantastic. You've really given us a lot of insights um, and things to think about that I, I really appreciate. So I'm definitely glad you were here. And this is great because next week we're going to be continuing in a similar theme discussing religious trauma and the negative impacts of purity culture. Um, so I think this has been a great kind of primer for everyone as well for that. And so that's going to be next week with uh, Christy Lanterman. And we're going to talk about in the 1980s and 90s, sexual purity became a major focus in sectors of Christian culture within the United States. And this movement is now what we refer to as purity culture and has detrimental effects, including stunted LGBTQI plus identity exploration, dissociation, body, underreported sexual assaults, and relationship struggles. And so we hope that you guys can all join us as we explore the specific concepts taught within purity culture, its impacts and developmental trauma, as well as some tips and resources for identifying the trauma in oneself and working through it. So that will all be next week. Um, and as always, uh, just a reminder, all of the previous RFRX recordings can be found on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash recovering from religion. And this episode will go up there uh, shortly as well. So if anybody missed it or came in late, wants to revisit it, it will be there. And again, you can send any questions or comments to us at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. And don't forget to visit our blog at medium.com slash excommunications or our podcast at recoveringfromreligion.org slash podcast. And I'm going to stop saying URLs out loud now and pass it over to Eric to talk about how to connect with us. <laughs> Thanks, Kara. I love it. Um, folks, um, RFR would not be able to do these kinds of things without people donating, without people donating their money, without people donating their time, or even both. But there are some folks who uh, can't do that, which is perfectly fine. But if you want to help out RFR, and if, even if you can donate your money, donate your time, perfect. But if you can't do that, then we are all over social media and it really, really helps us out if you can follow, if you can interact, if you can share, blah, blah, blah. You know how all that works. Um, so uh, if you want to help us out, um, going the social media route works perfectly. I'm going to drop some links to all of our social media in the chat. And, um, you want to read them uh, all out loud? <laughs> you want me to give the URLs and everything like that too? Yeah. Everyone's got <laughs> it, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll be in the description. I don't need to. <laughs> All right, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and we're on TikTok for you young uns. <laughs> Uh, in addition to that, there has been a demand for us to have a newsletter, and we got that going. And so if you would like to have the resources in your inbox, uh, for this talk in your inbox, and also some news about recently published RFRX videos, as well as recently published blogs and all sorts of other news that's going on with RFR, you can sign up for our newsletter and I'll drop up a link in the chat for that as well. Um, all right. So um, without further ado, let's bring on Dr. Dale Ray for some closing thoughts. Thanks, Eric. And really thanks a lot, Aaron. I, this, this has exceeded my expectations. This is really, uh, it was actually so fun. Uh, I had so much fun just reading your book. I read a few titles uh, before the hand, but I want to tell you, anyone that wants to be entertained for a night or two, go get her book, and, uh, and, and uh, you will find yourself laughing. Uh, at least half the time, I was out loud laughing about shit, and I'm in my room alone reading, so that's how good it was. She's a good writer. I think she's probably a comedian, but she didn't show that side of herself. 
tonight, I, I don't think. Um, so uh, I, I want to emphasize that what we've emphasized several times already, and that is you're not alone. That's a motto of Recover From Religion. And it helps, even if you can't come out, it helps if you reach out and help and talk to somebody else. It doesn't just help you. It helps that other person who may not be able to come out either. It's, it's, if you were a volunteer for us on the chat line, you would see day after day after day, people coming to us saying, I can't talk to anybody. And our main focus is, well, let us connect you to somebody. And I think whether you can volunteer for us or you can donate for us, we'd love it if you could. But if you can't, at least reach out to somebody else and support them in their need to stay under the radar because there's a lot of, there's a lot of non-believers out there and they just don't have any friends. They don't think they're the only person in the world that believes this or doesn't believe. So be a, be a helper to somebody else. I, even if it's on the internet, it's not even in person. I think you can be very helpful to people. Uh, last but not least is, uh, the excursion. We are super excited to, as we announced last week, the excursion is on. Uh, we think it's going to be oversold. It's at least going to sell out probably like it did last time. So if you're interested in joining us in the excursion in North Carolina in September, get your registration in early. If you've got any questions, just contact us through the Recover from Religion website and we can answer any questions you have. I guarantee you will have a blast. And uh, I personally will be leading a hike on the Appalachian Trail. And you don't have to be, you don't have to be a hiker to enjoy this hike because it's not real long, but I guarantee you're gonna learn all sorts of shit about the nature and the trees and the animals and all that sort of stuff on the Appalachian Trail. Among many other things, that's, that's only one hour of our, our whole weekend. And it's optional, of course. You don't have to go if you don't want to. Uh, we, so please look at the excursion on our website and um, register if you possibly can as soon as you can. Mm -hmm.